Welcome, everybody. I'm Chris Harbaud. And I'm Mary Sia. And welcome from the Southwest Wings Board here in the Sky Islands of Southeast Arizona. We'd like to also welcome a couple of our board members who are on the call and just acknowledge them. They're Sherry and Priscilla. We want to say thanks. Without you guys and the other members, uh, we wouldn't be able to do any of this. So welcome, welcome. And uh, we're just delighted to uh, be presenting our online summer speaker series in lieu of the live events that we obviously can't do this year. So there's all new inventions in order to do a presentation and bring our community together to stay connected. And um, this is our second speaker um, today. It's going to be um, introduced by Chris Harvard right here. Thank so you. yeah, today I'd like to welcome Mike Foster. He will be familiar to many, many of you who've been up to the Carr House, where he'll be talking to you there about the history and wildlife of the area. Um, he also uh, is a regular at the Southwest Wings Summer Festival, giving talks and showing his fabulous films because Mike's a very talented filmmaker. He's made a lovely film for Southwest Wings, which is available on our website. If any of you haven't seen it, do go to www.southwestswings.org and see this fabulous film. So Mike's uh, particularly interested in the culture um, and the plants and other wildlife of Sonora in Mexico. He's traveled and spent a lot of time in that area. And he's gained a particular interest in the food of that area. Now, of course, this is the type of region that spills up and becomes the Sky Islands where we are in southeastern Arizona. And so Mike is talking to us today about the edible plants of southeastern Arizona. So Mike, over to you. We tip your hat to you. <laughs> Mike. Mike, start over and turn your microphone on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, okay. <laughs> Take two. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate um, uh, being here. It's so nice to present for the wings uh, over Zoom. And uh, normally uh, I do a tour when we go through uh, the forest around the car house. So I do a presentation at Cochise uh, College about edible plants, that's about an hour. And then we go out to the car house and we walk around the grounds and we uh, uh, see a lot of these plants firsthand. Uh, so, it looks like the car house might be opening up soon. Uh, stay tuned. We might be opening up in September and uh, we'll be keeping a very good social distancing. I'm going to sit behind a picnic table and have an area roped off um, so that none of us get too close, but I'll be there to answer questions and we'll be sitting outdoors. We, uh, we won't be going into the house until uh, things improve. Uh, anyway, uh, today I'm going to, I put together a PowerPoint presentation about uh, my experiences with uh, plants in, the, in this area. And so let me go over and share my screen with the PowerPoint presentation. Mike, just want to mention to the folks that while you're doing that, we, um, we're going to take question and answers at the end of your talk so if they can hold on to those and we can do those at the end. Thank you. Okay, so here we are. I assume everybody can see that. <clears throat> so um, these are some pictures for those of you who don't really know where we are uh, or what it looks like in this part of southeastern Arizona, but this is the Coronado National Memorial and uh, in southeastern Arizona, we, you'd be considering Tucson part of that. Uh, we have elevations ranging from about 2,000 to 10,700 feet. And the pictures you see here are Cochise County and uh, from the Coronado National Memorial. And in the background where you see the Sky Island, you'll see the San Pedro River running through. So here in Cochise County, we're going from about 4,000 up to uh, 9,500 feet. 
And uh, that idea of the Sky Island is real important. You usually hear a lot about the Sky Islands when you go to the Wings presentations. And I found this picture on the internet and I thought it was a really good illustration. And Sky Islands are the mountains that stick up above the desert. And here the clouds make it look a little bit more apparent. Uh, the Sky Islands are covered with green because we get more precipitation up in the mountains. Down in the San Pedro, we might get 10 inches a year on an average, and up in the mountains, 30. So we have coniferous forests up there with uh, Douglas fir and ponderosa pines and southwestern white pines. So here we can see the way that vegetation shakes out in our uh, southwest. Down at the bottom, we see that we have, you know, the really dry areas with the creosote bush moving up into the saguaros and then we get into grassland and then up into the madrean woodland and that's pretty much where i've concentrated is from the grassland at 4,000 feet up to about 6,000 feet but there's uh, plenty throughout that whole area and um you, you can see there's that's what makes it so uh advantageous for getting wild plants because there's such a wide variety of species here. So as we go through the slides, you'll see I've put a link and they're live links on the presentation and someday I might put that presentation online and uh, people could go and actually click on the live links if they want to know more about the individual um, plants. So this is a list of plants, uh, plant videos that are related to the scenes that you'll be seeing, and you'll see them up in the top right-hand corner. As you can see here with the saguaro, there, there's the live link up in the top in yellow. And uh, so I just thought I'd start out today by talking about what I've been uh, doing this summer. So uh, since uh, the virus is here and I didn't want to travel, I just stayed in southeastern Arizona and went up around Tucson and over to the Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument and I started following the blooms of the saguaros in May and then came back in June and started harvesting them. And so I have a friend there, Angeles Emery, who's from the Valle de Tehuacan in Mexico. And if you watch that uh, saguaro fruit harvest video, you'll see us out there harvesting the fruit and preparing it and to learn more about other columnar cactus. Uh, the best part of the saguaro fruit, which is really tasty, a lot of times, um, native foods or wild wild uh, foods don't taste that good but the saguaro fruit that falls and if it gets caught in one of the bushes it dries out or you can take it home and dry it out in a secure location but over on the right hand side you see me holding a fruit that fell out and got suspended in a bush and then it dried out so it's like a dried saguaro fruit and it just tastes delicious uh the tahana autumn uh, which were the indigenous people of this area would uh, call that June. So then I went, when I went over to Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument, which is in southwest Arizona, um, I tried all these different cactus. And so the pitaya, the Oregon Pipe Cactus, is the best tasting of them all. And you can see that. The sanita is okay. And then as you go down to Mexico, there's the Echo and the Cardone, but these are all the Sonoran uh, cactus, uh, columnar cactus fruit that um, I've been uh, eating recently. And uh, I have a good friend, Kathy Callingham, who made this wonderful um, presentation of all the different columnar cactus in the state of Sonora, and uh, including uh, some that are in Arizona. And uh, the video, uh, concentrates on all of these cactus. And then as you go into fur further south into Mexico, you get even other kinds. And the pitaya that they have down there is not the same pitaya that we have up here. They just call it pitaya. It's a vernacular term for the for one of the stenocerises. And uh, one of the things I, reasons I concentrate on these columnar cactuses is, is that uh, when I was talking to people in Alamos, when, when you talk to people in Mexico, you get a different feel for how they uh, uh, consider history to have happened. And uh, one of the ideas I found fascinating was that uh, cactus seeds were probably ground up before corn was developed, you know, maybe 10, 000, as much as 10,000 years ago. The cactus seeds were ground up and these little cakes were made 
uh, fried out of uh, cactus seed. And so a, a torta in Spanish means a cake and the tortilla would be a little cake. And the tortilla is such an iconic um, food of Mexico. Uh, and I just think it's so cool that this, the saguaro or the cactuses, the columbia cactuses are very iconic too, that you kind of go back into history and get a really interesting uh, perspective of Mexico, thinking that perhaps the first uh, little foods they cooked were cakes made out of uh, cactus seed, which later became tortillas when corn was developed. So as um, I watch some of these shows on TV, I'm a little embarrassed to say that I do watch them, but um, I like to think about how I could survive in southeastern Arizona compared to some of the other locations that you see. And there's so much to eat here that I really don't think it would be an issue, especially if you started in June and you had, if you started in June and you had a way of uh, preserving your food, then you could um, um, have, have even a better chance of surviving. Hold on, I gotta turn off my phone here. Uh, okay, so, so some of the uh, most productive plants would be the uh, mesquite, the agave, and the oak, and we'll see those. Here is the um, mesquite in, a lot of indigenous people call it the pechita, and you can um, see the plant and see the uh, pods. And if you go to the farmer's market in Sierra Vista or Bisbee, you might see this contraption and you can pick your own beans. I recommend, I recommend getting your beans before uh, the rainy season starts and they start to mold. Uh, supposedly the mold isn't very good for you but try to get the beans when they're fresh, let them dry out and then take them into the farmer's market. And uh, you can pay to have them put it through this contraption and they grind it up. You can see the flour there. And a lot of people seem to like to make the cookies. And then I have a video up in the top with my friend Angeles Emery where she made an atole, the pechita uh, drink. And there, there are tons of mesquite. Those of us who live in Cochise County know that mesquite are everywhere. So there's a lot of it. Another plant that there's a lot of is the century plant or the maguey. And our most common one here, especially in the lower areas, is the uh, palmari agave. And uh, they would find uh, Apache cooking pits where the Apache would take this plant. They would cut off the leaves and turn it into a piña. In Mexico, they call it a piña. And you can see the heart of the agave with the leaves cut off of it and then they would roast it and it would turn all the starches into sugars, caramelize them into sugars like you see in the pencas down below in the lower right hand corner. And that's the part that uh, people would chew on. And the, the video up at the top is about Don Chewy, who is uh, in La Aduana near Alamos, Mexico. In each uh, year around Easter time, he will make these uh, pencas of mezcal, he calls them and you can just chew on them and suck out the molasses-like um, liquids. Uh, another plant that's like it is the sotol, the desert spoon that we see all over in this area, a very, very common plant. And so when they run out of the agave, so if you look up in the upper right-hand corner, you see a piña de agave, and then just below it, you see the piña de sotol. So uh, a lot of times if you see somebody making uh, uh, Bacanora, which is one of our local um, or, or Sonoran uh, alcoholic beverages, which is like tequila, essentially tequila. If they run out of agave, they might take satols and roast those together. So you're getting both. But there is a drink that's made out of just the desert spoon called satol, and you see a picture of it there. And uh, uh, this man seems to be enjoying a, a horn, <laughs> pouring some out of a horn into a cup and drinking it. Uh, so we were saying that there were the three big productive plants here uh, and we just looked at the, um, uh, the agave and the mesquite. So here's the other one. If you come here in late June, the acorn, the emery, the emery oak acorn is producing what we call beotas. And we have six different species, uh, at least six in the Huachucas. 
And this is the one that doesn't have to be uh, treated. A lot of them are so bitter, you have to boil them and try to get out those tannins, the bitter uh, flavors. But these ones you can eat right as they fall onto the ground. And I recommend picking them up as soon as they hit the ground uh, because if it rains, then they start to spoil quickly. This year, for some reason, they came in in uh, uh, July, later in July. So uh, they just uh, passed. And so the Apache have a um, treaty with the US government to go into Fort Huachuca where their favorite Emory Oaks are and they can collect them. So if you go up there in late June or July, you can see Apache people from the Fort Apache Reservation down here gathering the acorns. And they'll leave them out on the ground uh, in the hot sun on blankets and then the little worms come out. And so you have fewer worms if you let them sit out in the sun for several days on a blanket and prevent them from spoiling. But then they grind them up into a mash and they use it in, in a soup. And uh, they told me when I talked to them that they make these albondigas, which are um, corn, little corn balls, kind of like, uh, like a meatball, uh, but made out of corn. And they put those inside uh, in a soup um, made of acorns. Uh, and if you go to Mexico, it's, it's interesting. You go right across the border into Naco, you'll see everybody has uh, bayotas in their pockets. And you come to the United States and nobody has bayotas. Uh, so people love it in Mexico. Kids gather them and put them in bags and they sell them in stores. So it's really common in Mexico, not, not at all common in the United States. It's a big cultural difference just going across the line. So uh, the choya buds or uh, chiolin that the autumn call it, um, can be made of two different kinds of uh, choyas. And I have a really neat uh, video there from, that I filmed uh, Jesus Garcia from the Sonoran Desert Museum. And uh, he showed me, I, I wondered for years, you know, you can, you can see on the extreme left-hand side just how many spines they have. And so it was always a mystery to me, how do you eat those things? And so this video will show you how to do it. Apparently, you can, you can just whisk it in a basket. Uh, made out of uh, the Gooding Willow and uh, whisk made out of uh, the bear grass. And within about 15 seconds of whisking, the big spines fall off and they don't have the tiny little glaucids that are so bad. But um, that's a really nice food that uh, often people make. And occasionally you can find them in uh, um, being cooked. There was a place called the Desert Rain Cafe, no longer has existed, but there are other places that uh, you can find the choya buds. Uh, so here, uh, starting at about 5,000 feet, you'll find the manzanita, which means little apple, and uh, very, very common. Uh, the bears love it, and the berries are getting ripe right about now. Uh, once they dry out, they start to get, uh, oh, just kind of mealy, and they get caught in your throat when you eat them. But if you catch them before they're too ripe, when they start to wrinkle, uh, you can eat them right off the bush and they're not too bad. But uh, another thing people will do, will get them when they are mature and uh, submerge, crush them up, submerge them in water and let it ferment a little bit and make a cider. And uh, a close relative of the, um, or any, of a plant that looks very similar to the um, manzanita is the Arizona madrone, the madroño. And people supposedly make a cider out of that too. And the leaves, uh, when I was in the Sierra Madres, a man said, uh, we use those uh, to clean our teeth, to get out the sarso off, off of their teeth. So they just chew up the leaves. And I thought it was about, I tried it, it was about one quarter as effective as a toothbrush and it tasted terrible. But I guess if you're out in the woods, it's uh, better than nothing. Uh, so the Arizona walnut, um, is very common as you start to go up into the canyons. Uh, even down on the river, you'll find it. And I made a video on that. And you know, there are walnuts that you'll find in other parts of the US. I'm, in, I'm originally from Michigan and we have a big walnut tree there. Well, this is a different species of the walnut, uh, but it's uh, very similar. And the idea of a relic forest is that uh, back during the last um, ice age, it was cooler and wetter. So uh, plants like the walnut, deciduous tr uh, trees and pine trees, forests, 
probably were spread over a much wider area. And then as the uh, ice subs, um, retreated, uh, things started to dry out. These plants could no longer exist out in the desert areas, but they could exist in the little riparian areas along streams. And so they retreated up into the mountains. And we call those little uh, forested areas along streams in the mountains, we call those relic forests. So you'll see even maple and uh, sycamore and uh, you know, of course the, uh, the walnut. And you can just break these like uh, any other walnut. You don't have to explain how to eat a walnut. Uh, we have also the border pinon, the pinus discolor. And I think we all know about uh, pine nuts from up around the Four Corners area. And those, that's the edulous. And those, almost every nut has something in it. Our border pinon, about one out of every 10 nuts that you break has something in it. So it's not at all as good as the one you find up the edulous that you find up in the Four Corners. Uh, but you can eat it. And if you're starving, you might as well. You've got plenty of time. Uh, just go and break them and see uh, what you can find. And here is the nutleaf hackberry. These are really common down in the desert areas and they grow in some really harsh conditions. Uh, I have them sprouting all over my yard. And if you go down along desert washes, you'll see a lot of them down along the river too. And the birds love this plant and you can tell uh, the bark, it gets a warty bark when it's uh, uh, maturing. And it's a very gangly looking plant as you see here. And that's kind of a generous picture of the, uh, of the berries there, but you can eat them. Uh, not a lot of flesh on them, but a, another edible plant, another edible tree. And uh, again, in the riparian areas in the mountains, on the mountain sides, you will find the choke cherry. And those are actually good tasting. So we have at least two um, elderberries. And as you go up into the mountains, you'll find the one that uh, is the, I'm thinking it's the Sambucus nigra, the Canadiensis. And then down along the river, you have the Mexicana, Sambucus um, Mexicana. And you'll see that it has little white flowers. Those are a common remedy in Mexico. So what people would do, uh, since the stems can be somewhat poisonous, you just cut them off and then let them dry off and shake off the flowers so that you have only the flowers and make a tea and it's good for breaking a fever, especially with uh, youngsters. And then the berries, probably a number of us have made a juice out of the berries or just eaten them or maybe even made a wine or a preserve. And the yuccas, um, a big yucca around here in the San Pedro Valley is the soap tree yucca. And it has a nice tasting flower. Now, not all yuccas have a nice tasting flower. It's like you have to try different yuccas and, until you find one that has a less bitter flower. Uh, the, we have a yucca baccata, which I found, uh, find inedible. And you'll find that growing in the same areas. So if you identify this one, the soap tree, it's got a good tasting flower. And the yucca, um, yucca the shot dye that you find up in the canyons. Uh, that has a good flower too. If you cook them a little bit, you can get rid of some of the bitterness and you pour off the juice. But uh, uh, in Mexico, people love that. Down along Texas, there are some species that are very edible. And what I've found, I actually have a video on that. What I found is that uh, they uh, like to get the buds before they've opened up, just as they're starting to open up. And that's the best tasting uh, yucca flower. So we do have a wild grape here. I'm certainly not going to rave about that. Um, the Vitus Arizonica has a very small grape. I once heard that Padre Quino brought grapes to the New World. Uh, and I don't, uh, grapes were obviously here before he got here, but I think he brought a domesticated um, uh, grape that was uh, good tasting, that had big juicy fruit. Ours doesn't, but um, it's better than going hungry but uh, probably not by a lot. The uh, Russ aromatica, the skunk bush, the two ones at the top, uh, beautiful red color in the fall, and you can uh, take the little berries off and uh, eat those. They're 
they're kind of sweet and tart at the same time. But it's not the only Russ uh, plant. There's the uh, mus Russ microphylla that you see down below, which grows in even lower uh, vegetation. And in the canyons, you see the Russ glabra, which is ones that you'll, the same one that you'll see in the Midwest that the Boy Scouts would make a lemonade uh, like tea out of. And you don't really chew on it like that. That's just kind of a humorous picture. You, you, you make a tea out of it. And then uh, another one you'll find, you can find these in the Ramsey Canyon Preserve. Um, there are a number of these growing there and you can eat, eat those uh, berries off the Mahonia volcoxi. Um, I, I, they've said that they're a little bit uh, toxic, but a lot of things are toxic. I hear that even the onions are toxic. Uh, you can eat too much of anything, but uh, you can eat these if you don't eat them in great quantities. Uh, any wild food I don't think I would eat in great quantities until I became accustomed to it. So here are some of the more herbaceous uh, edible plants. And so in Mexico, the word quelite is about equivalent to greens here when we talk about wild greens. Uh, those, uh, that's what calites are. So on this poster, you can see the different kinds of calites and I'm gonna cover some of them here. Uh, but lamb's quarter would be one of the more uh, recognizable ones. And um, you'll see this all over about this time during the rainy seasons. Uh, the purslane will come out, the verdu verdulaga. And there are a number of other plants that are purslanes. Uh, there's the portulaca and a number of other ones that are similar to this, uh, that are supposedly very uh, nutritious, uh, good plants. They taste a little bit, um, a little bit tart, but a good tasting plant. The amaranth you'll see, and when its leaves are young before it goes out into seed, like these two ones, these two ones are doing, uh, the leaves are like spinach. You can pick off the leaves and boil them like spinach. But then when they go to seed and they dry out, you could uh, winnow them and get the little seeds out. And if you go down to Mexico nowadays, you will find uh, a lot of amaranth uh, candies. So here's another one, uh, the jewels of Opar. And sometimes you wonder how plants uh, get their names, those vernacular names that I guess you could apply any name to a plant. Uh, the scientific name is, of course, the one that we want to use so that we know exactly what we're talking about. But uh, Jules of Opar, I found a very curious vernacular word for, the, uh, for this plant. And uh, that came from the Tarzan movies. And, and it's a good tasting plant. You'll see it all over this time. Uh, grows in many places during the monsoons. And it's not bad tasting. So here's the... Uh, uh, watercress or berros that um, uh, was brought over from Europe. You'll see those in the streams. And uh, so here's the uh, ground cherry, the thesalis. And to me that looks an awful lot like the tomatillo. And I'm not always sure, I mean who is sure about how uh, plants were domesticated. Uh, I wonder if this had anything to do with uh, uh, the plant that we now call the tomatillo. So I also, so the, the way you know that these are ripe is when they fall to, fall to the ground and you can go just lightly touch the little lanterns and if they fall to the ground, then they're uh, ready to eat. So the devil's claw, I have a whole video on that, uh, is a very sticky plant. If you get those pods, you know, the books will say you can eat them, but they're so sticky, I don't think I would ever want to eat, eat them like uh, okra. But the seeds that later come out of the pods uh, are not bad tasting. So once they dry out, you can break them apart and eat those and they, um, they have a good taste. And uh, the Optum would use these medicinally too uh, to, to break a fever. They'd make a tea out of the uh, seeds. And uh, I hadn't included this before, but uh, you know, I've seen the cattails uh, populations increase and decrease and at times there were no cattails along the river and now there are. Uh, there are some uh, water treatment areas that uh, hit the um, caliche layer and came out in the streams. Um, the little arroyos coming into the San Pedro River like um, Escapule, Curry, Curry Draw, 
And if you go there, you'll find the uh, cattail growing. And even on the river nowadays, you're finding the cattail. And so I just found this one recently. And people will pull out the center uh, leaves and chew on them, the white bases. They just chew on that and has a good taste. The, um, the root is very fibrous, but you can boil it and uh, starches will come out. And some people uh, take the pollen off the top, the, um, the male flower, which is up top, and uh, use that and it's supposedly very nutritious. So um, if I could take advantage of the indigenous help, and by that I mean uh, the indigenous people uh, have been dealing with these plants for a long time, and they would uh, hybridize or selectively breed plants to develop them into a better crop. So I'm going to cover a few of those uh, ones that have been developed into better food sources. And so I'll show you what some of them are. And good examples of those would be the tepary beans, the teosintes, the cucurbitas, uh, prickly pears, and the chiltepines, which are the really hot peppers. So if you walk along the San Pedro, and it's been a very dry year, so you might, might not see as many as you'd like, but uh, a lot of times you'll see the wild tepary beans growing all over the place. And the autumn are big on these. They'll make a uh, hummus out of these tepary beans. Um, but uh, I would assume that they develop these into other beans uh, later on. So I think this would be like a building block of uh, better beans, selectively breeding them. And if you go into the Tahana autumn reservation, you'll find lots of varieties of the tepary bean that uh, have different colors and uh, patterns on the beans. So uh, the teosinte, which grows all over around here, just along the border, uh, one of the uh, leading theories was that the teosinte uh, was crossed with zea maize to produce corn down in the Valle de Tehuacan in Mesoamerica and in central Mexico. And um, so I, I included both here. I, I've never tried to eat the teosinte, uh, but I did talk to a man on the Autumn Reservation who, when he's trying to introduce different qualities back into his corn, he'll grow the teosinte next to his corn. And he also told me an interesting thing was that um, he was developing different uh, varieties of corn, trying to get a pink colored corn. And he was able to, to do that by breeding the plant and do it within seven years. I always thought it would take, you know, a hundred years to come out with a different variety of corn. And uh, so I have another uh, video, which I didn't put the link here, but uh, last year I did a video with a friend of mine, Angeles Emery, and we took the corn smut, the wheat lacoche, and uh, cooked it. And, uh, you know, it really doesn't have much taste, uh, but it's, it's a mushroom, it's a fungus, and it's uh, good for you. And, when you cook it with episote, which is one of the quilites, and uh, fry it and put a little cheese and put it on a tortilla, it's a delicacy. People in Mexico love it. And uh, there's a place, the uh, Arivalos Ranch, that uh, had it. And uh, they began to sell it and make a lot of money in Tucson uh, with higher end restaurants that wanted to provide this on their menu. And I just get a kick out of looking at. Uh, Indian corn. So maize criollo is essentially the word uh, that translates into Indian corn. And uh, native seed search in Tucson uh, is, I got these pictures from them. They are preserving these uh, strains of corn and keeping the seeds because unfortunately in, in Mexico nowadays, they went in the United States, they're using the white corn and uh, they've given this stuff up. But you can find the nice uh, blue corn for sale in uh, you know corn chips and uh, even in Mexico nowadays you'll find blue corn flour but I, I wish we kept more of these native strains because they're I imagine they're healthy I can't don't know for sure but they just look like they'd be more healthy and they certainly are attractive and uh, they uh, their flavors would be uh, interesting to try so uh, one of the videos I made is on a tesquinado which is uh, where people will um, collect the wild corn and um, grind it up and then let it steep, they'll boil it and get the, uh, the, the liquid and let it ferment in those containers down below. 
and it becomes mildly alcoholic, but it's mildly alcoholic. Uh, even kids will drink it and you'll find it on the streets being sold. There'll be vendors on the streets that will sell Tosquino and um, it, you know it's thick and very rich and I've even seen uh, corn ice cream for sale in places but I did a whole video on how you can make your own alcoholic drinks from uh, maize criollo uh, and they have a ceremony the Tarahamaras would have a ceremony so I include the ceremony in the video. Uh, so I, I also wonder about some of these uh, uh, gourds that you see growing, the buffalo gourd. And I wonder, you know, how were those, uh, were those ever used to domesticate a, uh, a gourd of today? And it looks like the Tahana Autumn, um, they had a thing they called the hull uh, squash, which looks pretty close to it. And then, um, you know, they, I, I read that a lot of the squash were developed in central Mexico, but uh, you know, maybe some other qualities were reintroduced here up on the border. And so you see another squash over to the right that, you know, looks like it's not too far from the uh, buffalo gourd. And then, you know, as you get up into the Midwest, you get all those beautiful gourds. And this man was down in Sinaloa, where they grow these kushas that were just uh, beautiful, big uh, gourds. And if you go into the markets in Mexico, you'll see piles of squash that they store all year round. They just let them sit in the corner. Even when it's really hot in the summer, they'll just have these piles of squash that they can use um, most of the year. And so here's the prickly pear and the nopal, and uh, these are very successful food source. You can scrape off the spines and make the pad pads into nopalitos, uh, which are really good tasting. Uh, if you haven't tried it, um, try to find a Mexican restaurant that serves them. You can even find them in jars. Uh, I love those. It's one of the few things that I cook. And then the fruits are called uh, tunas. And you'll see that um, the wild ones were domesticated more into the ones that you see on the right. And if you go into Mexican markets, you can always find the red and the green ones. And you can just cut those open. They have big seeds in them, but you just uh, gum up the, uh, the, the flesh and swallow the seeds without trying to crunch them with your teeth. But they're very good. Uh, don't eat too many of them because they keep you pretty regular. Uh, you can eat maybe three, three at a time. I wouldn't go much beyond that. And the chiltepine, a really fun food that, um, or plant that you'll find, it's naturalized in yards. I was doing some yard work in um, Sierra Vista not long ago, and they had uh, these chiltepines growing all over the yard. And they're from this area. Uh, this is about their northern limit. I think they might go up to Mount Lemon and then down through Sonora. But these are the wild peppers and um, they lose their quality, this the certain quality that the wild pepper has. If you start to water them and cultivate them, uh, maybe they get less hot. But uh, that's a curious thing because this pepper is supposedly the mother of all peppers. And so when you see all these different varieties of pepper, uh, what I've read is that they all started with the uh, chiltepines. Uh, when you water them and cultivate them in certain areas and selectively breed them. I thought that was really quite interesting that the chiltepine is considered the mother of all chilies. And it's one of the one of the hotter ones too. And if you go down to Mexico, you can find it for sale. They uh, have them green and vinegar, or you can get the red ones. Uh, very hot, uh, but a good tasting pepper. And then uh, getting near the end here, this is the uh, uh, Colombian exchange when uh, uh, Columbus came over and then other explorers in our part of the world, it was Padre Quino that came through here and introduced the old world crops, you know, rice, wheat, barley, oats. And uh, then they took back, the Europeans took back the ones, the new world crops. And so it was a great exchange for uh, both uh, the old world and the new world. It, uh, you know, if you could, could you imagine uh, Ireland without potatoes or Thai food without uh, hot peppers or, uh, Switzerland without uh, chocolate, uh, or Italy without tomatoes. And so they got a lot of good things from us, but we got these good things. And if you think about it, a lot of those old world crops do very well here in Arizona in the winter. So whereas the autumn, the native people here would grow these plants, these summer plants, then they would have these really lean times during the winter. But with the addition of these things that Padre Quino brought here, then all of a sudden they could eat well all year round. So it was a huge 
uh, advantage to the indigenous people here, bringing in the European crops. And I just uh, like the names, the, Nal the Nalwalt, the uh, Aztec names. And so like uh, a, a lot of these words are not the actual Nalwalt word, but they're the, ver the Spanish version of them. Uh, these, this, the Nahuatl usually end in an L, which I find is very hard to pronounce, but the Spanish versions are like, we know the, some of these, the aguacate, chocolate, cacahuate, which is peanut, the chile, the chiltepin, which we just saw, the ijote, which is the green bean, elote, which is corn, the camote, which is a sweet potato, a pasote, a quelite, huitlacoche, jicama, jitomate, mesquite, when you're using the word mesquite, you're using an Aztec word, nopal, the prickly pear, acote, peyote, quixote, all of these wonderful words that uh, when, when you hear the Spanish spoken in, the, in Mexico, it has a lot of words which you won't hear if you go to Spain uh, because they, uh, we've, been, we've adopted a lot of, the, uh, the, the, the Mexicans have adopted a lot of these indigenous words. And then I just get a kick out of some of these weird uh, names that we've applied to um, to plants. You know, I like the way the plants look. You know, for me, I just visually like the way plants look, the squash, the corn, whatever. And I, I get a kick out of the names, the Aztec names or our names. And so uh, we're bringing the thing to a close and we can open it up to questions. But uh, this is my email if anybody uh, would like to email me with questions. Um, and then there is my video site. Uh, you can go in and see the videos. And uh, I, if you have a question on a specific plant, I can probably find a link where I made a whole video about it and send you that. So uh, feel free to contact me if you want to. And uh, now I will turn control back over to Mari I, and Chris. And are you doing that? Do I do that? <laughs> hey, we're back. we're back. We're back. That was so great, Mike. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was wonderful. Thank yeah, you. and talking about names for plants, I remember across in the UK where I grew up in Yorkshire, we had growing in a, um, a, a place just at the back of my house what was called a strawberry tree. And that's a type of arbutus like madrone. But its, um, it's scientific name is Arbutus unado because although it's called strawberry tree, Unado means you only eat one, and boy you do, because it's bitter as hell, it's terrible, but it looks wonderfully edible, but sadly not. And then when I moved to Cambridgeshire, and there I used to make wine out of the elderberries and the elder flowers as well. So even across in England, we, we, we can make things out of the, the local elderberries, just as you do here. And then so, you serve them to the elders. That's it indeed, yeah. yeah that's so um, if you have any questions and uh, no. uh, for, for Mike, please let us know. We have a question here from Karen and we're going to let Karen ask it live. In just a moment, <laughs> yes. We'll um, unmute you Karen and you can ask Mike the question. While we're waiting, the, the Madrone, by the way, is very good tasting, unlike the uh, European variety. It's very good tasting. I always thought it was poisonous, and mm -hmm. then I read that it was edible. I began eating them, and they're sweet. They're good tasting. Mm -hmm. Anyways, Karen, what, what was your question? Karen, you can go ahead and talk if you unmute yourself. Karen Vandergrift. Okay. Um. Well, Karen's question, Mike, was, do you offer foraging seminars in the field? Yeah, so uh, at the car house, um, you know, when this virus is over, uh, I think it'll be more successful. I, I, don't, I don't know if we could really do it right now, but uh, yeah, please come to the car house. I'm there every Saturday and Sunday from uh, nine in the morning to four, actually a little bit more on each end and um, yeah please come I love to talk about this stuff and uh, we, we only average about 30 people a day so you know it's not like a national park vis visitor center where you know you're just kind of processing people I get a chance to actually talk to people in depth and I love talking about that and uh, many other subjects so yeah please come out 
And, uh, you know, we might even be able to make some arrangement. If you wanted a bigger group, you'd have to contact um, the board of directors and uh, they might be able to set something up. Or if not, you know, sometime I could uh, take a group of people once the virus was over and we could walk around in the Wachukas independent of the car house. So uh, yeah, I'd be quite willing to, it's a lot of fun. That's great. Great. Okay. So you look like a fun guy, Mike. So are there any mushrooms around that we might be looking after? <laughs> I steer clear of the mushrooms, but there's a wonderful person that comes to the car house. I just love this woman, uh, uh, Paola from uh, Italy, and she's so enthusiastic. You know, she comes out and uh, she, <laughs> she made me an omelet once out of eight different wild mushrooms. I, I was kind of leery of it, but she's still alive, so I figure she know, knows what she's doing. Uh, but, but I just don't venture into mushrooms. I leave that up to people who know a lot more, more about mushrooms than me. Good. Awesome. So we've got a question from Jackie have, Smith. Yes, we have a question from Jackie Smith. Is there a wild tomato that grows in the Sonoran Desert? Um, not that I know of. I, I do know in Alamos um, there are wild tomatoes growing all, all along some of the creeks, but I think that came from the wastewater treatment facility. <laughs> that, that they wash down there. So in Alamos there are potatoes, uh, tomatoes growing all over the place. Uh, there are some wild up in the Sierra Madres. I was surprised to find uh, wild potatoes. I went up there and I talked with a man and he was, he was living off the land. You know, he had cattle and uh, one of the things he does, I says, he says, we have potatoes here. And he just took a little stick and started digging in the ground and all these tiny little uh, potatoes came up and we ate them and they tasted just like potatoes. So I, you know, usually hear about potatoes coming from Peru in that area, but I think we had uh, varieties up in Mexico. So there are a few of those potatoes. Great. Cool. Um, we have a question from, um, thanks for answering that, Mike. We have a question from Fowling, Maine. Uh, what is the name used for the amaranth seed candy or bars? Hmm, I'm not sure. Gosh, you know, I, I have, uh, I keep some at the car house. Um, they probably, I can't. That's a good question. I call them amarantho. I don't know, you know, Dulce de Amaranto, maybe. Hmm. But yeah, if you go into Naco and, um, you know, once the virus is over, if anybody wants to come and have lunch in Naco, I love doing that. And there's a store there where you can go in and find these products. It's just a, a regular grocery store. Yes, nice. Uh, okay, so question from Karen Larson. When is the best time to harvest the Arizona walnut? So they're uh, falling off the tree right about now. Now would be a good time. I'd let them fall off the tree and uh, you know, you get your hands all stained with that ink that's in the flesh. Um, but this is a very good time for, for harvesting them. You break up the rock. They're not as meaty as the uh, European, uh, the English walnut, but they're good. Um, in the Car, Car Canyon, there was a guy named uh, Biederman who, um, developed a walnut tree where he grafted the English walnut onto the rootstock of the Arizona walnut because our rootstock was more, more drought tolerant, more disease tolerant, and uh, he grew walnuts for a while in Car Canyon. Good. Good. So we've got um, Ingrid Schubert. If you'd like to um, ask your question live, if you have your microphone on, you can go ahead and ask it. Good morning. I hope uh, you can hear me. We can. Um, oh, good. That was a very interesting presentation. Thank you. Um, I love the subject of being able to eat local plants, um, especially if you're hiking and you get lost and you get hungry. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, do you have a book with um, all this information that you published? No, uh, but if you come to the car house, uh, we have a number of monitors around the car house. Uh, so uh, I might put one outdoors if we open up uh, here in September. I, I might put one outdoors and I'll be able to run different videos. So uh, my whole thing is videos. I'm a videographer and I have, you know, over 300 videos on a variety of subjects in Sonora and Arizona, uh, cultural and natural history. And so I, I rely on uh, videos. And um, this one's going to be put online so you can review it. Uh, I don't know if it'll be available for download. Is it available for download? It's not available for download, but it will be available for two weeks after 
uh, your live presentation. Oh, hello, Ingrid. Hello. Where are you coming into us from? Where are you? Uh, in Napa. Wow. Napa. You're in Napa. Hope you're safe up there, Ingrid. Uh, it's still a bit smoky, the air, um, so uh, we can't have the windows open yet, but it's hopefully um, getting uh, contained and um, we'll have rain, but that, you know, who knows with that. <laughs> yeah, my daughter's up in San Francisco, yeah. so she's dealing with all that too. Uh-huh, okay. Well, I, uh, I'll look into it. I, uh, you know, I can turn the PowerPoint into a... Um, video and then I could put it on Vimeo and um, if I do that, if I get around to that, I, I think I probably will. I'll send um, Mari and Chris a link and then uh, you could get the link and you'd be free to download it. I, I don't protect my stuff. Uh, I saw when I was getting images off the internet, somebody had uh, put a watermark on their picture of a uh, watercress and I thought, well, really? <laughs> we got to protect pictures of watercress? Uh, <laughs> I don't protect my stuff. You know, I let people use it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, we love Mike's films, and uh, we have a wonderful one on the website, The Wild and Wonderful Sky Islands. Um, and, you know, hopefully, we'll, we do have these presentations, you know, recorded for a while. And it's all sort of a new process for us, and we'll see where it goes from here. Might be the wave of the future. Mm -hmm. A combination of live events and yeah. these uh, presentations, which are wonderful. So thank you very, very much, Mike. That was fabulous talk. Thanks for your question, Ingrid. Um, I'm really you. ready for my lunch now, I can tell you, after hearing all of that. that was, uh, <laughs> that's quite fantastic. And uh, yes, we will be making the, uh, the presentation available for at least uh, a couple of weeks, maybe longer, on the Southwest Wings um, website. There'll be a link through to it. Um, and uh, yeah, so thank you everyone for attending. Um, next month, we'll be having one of our actual Southwest Wings bird guides giving a talk. Oh, and by the way, welcome Melody and Robert, two of our guides I noticed who are, are watching. Um, yeah, Jeff Babson will be talking to us about the magical uh, world of the moth, which um, I think might shine a light on, on something I know not a lot about, I hope. Very much looking forward to that. That will be on September the 30th, and it'll be the same time and the same place. 30th of September, the Wednesday, same time, same place. Look forward to seeing all of you and hopefully some more in a month's time. Is everybody on the uh, mailing list? Uh, does, uh, there, there might be some people who aren't on the mailing list. How do they know how to get on the mailing list to be aware of these next presentations? If they contact us on admin at swwings.org. And also, if you've already registered, folks, for the online speaker series, you don't have to do it again. We already have your information, and we'll be sending the live links about um, a day or two before the actual event. Um, and the new talks will be uplifted or <laughs> uploaded onto our website um, as we continue forward which uh, we're getting a wonderful response. So we're really happy you're all enjoying it. And um, thank you very much for attending. I mean, did, did we answer the question about your foraging out in the field? Mm -hmm. yes. Oh yeah, okay, sorry. I was, I was out in the field at that <laughs> point, so um, pardon me. <laughs> so once um, again, yes, thank you very much, everyone. Um, thoroughly enjoyable presentation, Mike. And- um, Yeah, Mike. Look forward to seeing you somewhere soon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks a lot. You all be well and take good care. Bye. Bye. Bye.